You are Mr. Russell Granger, is that correct, from San Marcos High School. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I thought I was just going to talk about our transportation pathway at San Marcos Public High School, but apparently I'm also going to talk about why public school is just as good as a charter school. <laughs> all right? <laughs> if not better. Okay. Um, my San Marcos's career, um, automotive technologies career pathway uh, has five levels. Um, I have automotive technologies one and two, which is our introductory and intermediate courses in which uh, students work with small engines, uh, four stroke, overhead valve, exactly like what's in modern automobiles, it just only has one cylinder. Um, the way the class is designed is students are given a worksheet to follow, basically a set of instructions, a repair manual, a copy of my PowerPoint, I don't know if it helps, and uh, usually there are a number of students, if not all, who have smartphones, which they're encouraged to use. And what they need to do is, on their own, completely disassemble, inspect, repair the broken parts that my advanced students play with um, in their downtime, and then put it back together and get it to run. Now, they are not allowed to ask me for help without showing that they've accessed three possible solutions on their own as a group. So they learn collaborative skills as well as problem solving skills. And what this also does is prepare them for those moments, you've all had them, where you've got a set of instructions, you've got a computer, and you've got something that needs to either be put together, put back together, or fixed, right? And then hopefully these students have a heck of a lot of confidence uh, when they're done, uh, went too fast. So this shows you, um, I will randomly take photographs as students are working, and you'll notice in the background around each table, the students are focused, engaged, working together. Uh, my input is minimal at best, which is the way I like it. Um, they're teaching themselves uh, and learning on their own. And of course, making mistakes. Uh, to explain, these students manage to over torque a fastener, They've got to find the correct size fastener. They've got to repair the threads, get it back. Because you know, part of learning is, of course, making mistakes, solving those problems, sometimes of our own making. Um, once they've finished Auto One Two, if they are still interested, uh, ROP partners with the district. Those two classes are district courses, and with Santa Barbara City College. Uh, within this program, partnerships are everything. Um, in the fall, this will be third step in the automotive technology pathway. Uh, students are dual enrollment with Santa Barbara City College's Auto 101. They'll get credit there. They also get a weighted grade for this college level, extremely difficult course. Um, when they finish that in the fall, they can also enroll in spring, which is aligned with Santa Barbara City College's Auto 110. They can earn up to 12 units at Santa Barbara City College. So we get these freshmen, sophomores, juniors already with a significant amount of college credit, uh, already kind of pushing them in that door, which is great. And by the way, uh, speaking of partnerships, all of these pictures, cars they're working on, everything they do, 100% donate. Okay, so it all comes from, again, community member partnerships. Don't need a charter school to have involved parents. <laughs> all right? <laughs> Forgive me if I sound offended. Uh, uh, so, auto advanced and community member partnerships. So after you've finished a year and a half, you're the, the fifth level within San Marcos High School's automotive technology program, you get advanced projects. That's where it becomes like a business. Um, this is one of our projects. Uh, we have an electric Porsche. Well, actually, it came in. It was driven in on an internal combustion engine. This is what it looked like when we got it. Uh, and then one of the advanced projects is converting it to all electric. 
The students wanted a project, brainstormed, Googled. Turned out the year I started teaching, MIT had just converted a 914 to electric. They said, how cool. Mr. Granger, can we do it? Sure. <laughs> All we got to do is find the money, right, and find the car. And uh, it can't cost us anything. And, uh, and we did it. I mean, they did it. So that what allows opportunities for students to take what you just saw there and tear it apart, create those industry partnerships. So now we've got community partnerships turning into industry partnerships because now we've got a car and we don't have the facilities to do 100% of the job. So the students have to start making those connections within the community uh, because quite frankly, there isn't any business we're in where we take the product from start to finish and we're involved 100% with every step. Plus, it allows the students to get involved with people outside of their peer group, professionals, and it teaches them how to deal with them at a professional, peer-to-peer -peer level. Very difficult for teenagers. It also allows opportunities for this. If I teach them how to fix today's cars, by the time they get in the industry, they're not going to be, perhaps, prepared for the technology that is current. This allows us to work on things that are, quite frankly, a little bit pure futuristic. All electric cars, uh, hopefully most of us have heard of a Tesla, um, still very expensive, very, very cool, but rare. Um, that's what they're creating, not nearly as fast, but <laughs> not nearly as expensive either. What you see are the students working in a large group. We tear it down, uh, are always rebuilding this transaxle. Uh, the overhaul donated from Snyder Auto House. Uh, we had 14 inch four lug, 15 inch five lug, 911 brakes. All of this customization, all of this adaptation, the students have to figure out how do we do it, how do we make it work, and then make it work. I mean, we talk about critical thinking and problem solving skills, right? My goodness. I mean, it doesn't get any better. So this is what it looked like last year at Earth Day. You can see the batteries and et cetera, et cetera. Also with our industry partnerships is they buy into the system, literally. So these students will get cash scholarships um, to college of their choice. Every single one of these was at uh, the AAP Scholarship Award 2010. Every single one came out of the San Marcos High School program. Uh, some of these are in City College, and the one on the far left is in industry at Snyder Auto House. Uh, extremely successful young man, uh, really happy. But the uh, two on the left in industry, the two in the middle at City College now, the two at the right were graduates at the time. So the industry partners are paying to get well-educated, well-trained future employees. They're willing to invest. And it's not just a scholarship. It's a whole lot more. Partners in education. Partners with those industry professionals. Interns. I will have at least six paid student interns per year. Uh, the number was as high as nine one year. Um, they'll also, academic excellence awards, getting, I mean, these students need to be rewarded, shown that what they're doing is valuable. Um, they might know it on a certain level, but when they get that recognition from people outside of their peer group, it means the world. Also, to get them thinking of college or perhaps Another pathway, we partner with Santa Barbara City College. That's uh, the two department chairs of Santa Barbara City College's auto program, tailgating in the back of uh, a truck. Santa Barbara City College pays for the food. The Army pays for us to get into NHRA. And ROP pays for the bus. So all of us get together, and the students have a great day at the races and get to meet college professors in a very, very casual, non-intimidating environment. Gosh, college is starting to look fun, right? We also go once a year to UTI. Perhaps you're not college bound. Perhaps what you want to learn is a trade. So we, again, throw them on a bus, uh, take them to UTI, feed them lunch, give them a tour. Again, UTI is an industry um, 
educator um, is willing to foot that bill. So it's great to expose the students to those opportunities. Remind us what UTI is again. I'm over, sorry? over here. Over here. Oh, <laughs> Remember what? Remind us what I'm UTI. Sorry, over there. Yeah, <laughs> over there, over there. Tell us what UTI is oh, again. I'm sorry, I'm acronym crazy here. Uh, the Universal Technical Institute. Uh, they're a large trainer of if you want to be a diesel mechanic, motorcycle mechanic, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, we do all of that, and yet still there's this perception <laughs> that does not fit with the reality. So when I'm asked to speak at uh, functions such as these, I like to remind us that, you know, auto techs, I mean, this is what the reality is like. Um, average high school graduation rate nationally is around 91%. Uh, if you take CTE courses and kind of concentrate a little bit on that, that rate drops to about 75% if you do not concentrate in CTE. Pretty remarkable number. <coughs> San Marcos ROP grads that have taken at least one of my ROP classes are tracked. And right now, the graduation rate there, or I'm sorry, not the graduation rate, but the rate at which they go on to a technical school, community college, or four-year university is at 97.1%. So take one of my classes, and you've got a pathway. All right? And here are some alarming numbers which I heard at the um, uh, Partners in Education meeting. So I immediately emailed Dr. Friedlander, because. Uh, like you, I want to see the research, where the data is coming from. And they sent me five spreadsheets, mine through the data. And what it came down to is Santa Barbara City College uh, transfers to either a CSU or um, UC about 1,600 students last year, last school year. The number of students with BAs transferring into Santa Barbara City College with a BA is 1351. Yes, exactly. So you've got that degree, but do you have a marketable skill? They're going to City College, <coughs> entering nursing program, right? Automotive technologies program. Um, something that gives them that marketable skill. And when you look at Santa Barbara City College to UCSB, 422 went to UCSB, 538 went from UCSB with BAs to Santa Barbara City College to learn a marketable skill or trade. So just take that as you will. Yeah, but it, it knocked my socks off. Also, um, Kohler makes small engines. Uh, they donated thousands, literally, of small engines to California educational institutions. I went to Rio Hondo to pick up my 24 free engines. And while I was there, I was surprised to see representatives from Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, Chico State University, and San Jose State University. All of them getting donated motors because their engineering students were not coming to college prepared for the workload. They could not use tools. They did not understand how machinery worked together. So they had to take remediation courses. Uh, the universities did not want to spend the money for those for pieces of equipment, so they went out and got them donated. They all complained of the same thing. We're not doing a good enough job at the high school level. Um, career technical education in general and San Marcos High School's transportation pathway specifically provides students with the critical thinking and problem solving skills necessary to exceed in today's global economy. Um, there's no other way to say it. In our advanced class, the students take vehicles, either donated or community members. They talk to the customer when they come in, fill out the work orders, diagnose the vehicles, find out what's wrong all the parts place, order the parts, put them on the car, verify the repair is correct, call the customer, tell them it's done, how much it's going to be, et cetera, et cetera. They handle 100% of the process. All of it requires those 
soft skills that are necessary along with the technical skills to make students marketable. It does you no good to be the best in the room at something if you cannot <laughs> represent yourself well and convince people that you are uh, that person. Uh, so I work just as much on those personal skills, soft skills, if you will, as I do on those hard skills. And that's me, and that's my shtick. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I am reminded why you are such a popular teacher yeah. and so engaging, and that your students enjoy your program so much. And um, the last time you spoke, I remember you talked about uh, how how many skills you need to have to be successful in this in this <coughs> field, and that how the students of the future really need to be very high tech in their abilities because it's it's not a wrench and and just a you know a socket wrench anymore. I mean. Fixing cars are, are, are high power jobs these days and, and provide rewarding um, opportunities as careers as well. So, Yes, service industry is the one job that they cannot ship overseas. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's going to send their car to Japan to get it serviced. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's a high paying job that's not going anywhere. Great, great, thank you. Any board members? Ms. Cordero? Well, as you were giving your presentation, I was thinking, I need to take these classes. <laughs> um, but when I thought that to myself, I noticed that there were no women in the pictures. Ah, yes, there were. Oh, there were? Okay, yes. I didn't recognize, I didn't notice. Okay, so have, has it been very popular with the young women? No, not even close. <laughs> uh, but what I can say is once so a young lady gets her foot in the door, or a woman, uh, the ones who go all the way stick with the program are probably 75 percent um so yes if they're brave enough to sit in a room full of young teenage men which is no easy feat you know i, I admire them to no end you know what they're dealing with then yes they're there i have a young lady uh angelica ochoa who um took auto one two twice because she needed that extra time to be prepared for a college level course. And uh, she is going to get a scholarship next month. She does not know it yet. But uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> None of you know Angelica, do you? <laughs> okay, she's getting that and she'll get an internship this summer. So she'll be working as an auto tech. So it's okay. rare, but it does happen. And it is happening as we speak. Are, are you taking any uh, proactive steps to actively recruit? girls into the program? Yes, it's hard. Um, what we do as, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is one. Oh yeah, we should go back a little bit. Let's see, here we go. So this is the beginning. Oh yeah, no, I, let's see, so I gotta go, this is backwards? Is that it? Yeah, there's Frida. Um, that's Angelica, the young lady I was just talking about. Uh, that was her um, last year. Uh, so she's a senior, that's her as a junior. But yes, uh, when I do have young ladies, um, I'll never forget, young lady. Um, now I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. Um, oh, well, she's at Berkeley now. She's, she's managed to be successful without taking my advanced class. Uh, but yes, uh, because of scheduling conflicts, uh, she could not get in, but she came into my office. She thought it was me. You know, as if, you know, I was dying. I was loving so hard for this young lady. Uh, Amelia Wakamatsu. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, she took my auto one to really want to take the advanced class, but it's only offered first period, and she played water polo. So uh, that was also first period. So I think she made the wise choice. She uh, went to Berkeley on a full scholarship, academic slash uh, athletic. So. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Parker? I'll be brief just because, you know, fantastic presentation, oh, terrific program, so impressive, and I'm so pleased that one of our high schools has this particular career technical pathway. And I love to remind the community that our high schools all have various career technical pathways in them. I think people think that this is just gone from public high schools, when in fact I see them just getting better and better right now. We're sort of, I, I feel like we're getting in sort of a, a, a renaissance with it. Um, we just need more funding. Um, but my question is, can we please get a copy of this as an attachment to this item in our, uh, on the district website? 
Mm -hmm. um, because right now it just has the cover piece to it. And I would really love to be able to point members of the community to your uh, PowerPoint. Oh, so um, that would be great. So you have it on the hard drive here. You're good to go. Yeah, I try okay. to send us an email. It's too big. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Levon. Awesome. Oh, this, was, <laughs> this was neat. It was so great to uh, hear you give this presentation, to see what you're doing with the students. Um, and as Ms. Parker said, to remind um, the community that uh, career technical education is not um, out of our district. And uh, love to see the numbers that you also shared with us about the importance of keeping these programs in our school to make sure that we're engaging all our students. And if I was your student, I would be completely engaged in your class. So thank you for thank all you. you do. Thanks. Thank you. And, and hopefully the parcel taxes will pass and we'll provide some more money for career technical education as well because these are such valuable programs. So thank you so much for coming. Thanks for coming. Oh, Mr. Heron, I'll, I'll sorry. Just, I'll sorry, just comment. Mr. Uh, Mrs. Deacon mentioned that uh, I was at Partners when you made the presentation to Partners. And we'd just like to remind people that that was a room full of a lot of business people in the community. So it was a, a very broad reaching uh, group of very interested people who are very interested in career tech. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that at 7.30 in the morning. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. I'm always happy to promote San Marcos High School and our uh, pathway. I mean, people need to know. And Dr. Cash wants to make Yeah, a I want to oh, publicly acknowledge that Russell was recognized recently by the County Office of Education as one of the most outstanding teachers in our county. I had the pleasure of sitting at the same table with them that evening. And I also want to say that uh, you know, old gearheads can turn into even superintendents of school districts. And <laughs> I, I know that there's a Mr. Mertz from Long Beach Wilson who is no longer with us, who was, if he was alive, would be shocked to see me sitting here. <laughs> but he was very influential uh, in my auto shop class that I took um, not 60 years ago, but <laughs> getting closer every day. So it's really a distinctly honorable um, profession for um, our community to support um, is totally essential. Um, and the one thing that I, I had not seen this presentation that I was so happy to see you point out, Russell, is the fact that our most intellectual professions such as that are hot, require high concepts like engineering, those students still need to know how to place those in the context of work. And uh, you do such a tremendous job of, of that in your program. And it, as Ed knows, Ed Barron's, it's one of my favorite stops when I am at San Marcos was stopping by his room. So thank you. Thank you. OK, Harding. <laughs> thank you for being patient. We know you have important things to tell us. <coughs> and. So I'll be very brief. We're very excited. This is a very important time in our IB journey. Um, in May, we're expecting an authoriz authorization visit after four long, hard years of working together. So tonight, you'll hear from three speakers. We've changed the order because of the timing of the actual presentation. So our United Nations Council President, uh, Ariana Rubio, you'll have the pleasure of hearing from her. Um, Jennifer Lindsay, our IB coordinator and sixth grade teacher, and Karen Delfonso. And then we've left a little bit of time for questions and answers from all of us if needed. So I'd like to present to you our amazing we United Nations Council as an IB school, but really student council president. Dr. Cash has met her. She's truly an amazing girl. And I just want to acknowledge all the teachers and staff who are here. Many didn't come because of the time, and they have young children, but high interest, and thank you for having us. So Ariana, and I don't know if there's a way to, so you can see her face. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name's Ariana Rubio. I'm the United Nations Council President at Harding University Partners in School. I would like to state some of the highlights of why the IB program is awesome. At Harding, we have a learner profile. Some attributes are knowledgeable, risk taker, caring, balanced, and reflective. These are important to the students at my school because when we're grown up, we might be a risk taker, trying new things, or an inquirer, asking many questions. It's very important to show these attributes so when you, so when you, can have a, so when you grow up, you could have a great career. Last year, when I was in fifth grade, my class had learned about pesticides in a unit of how the world works. The two other classes were learning about what happens when you 
use drugs, and saving the rainforest. My class learned that pesticides were used for spraying your crops so bugs won't eat them. Pesticides can really affect animals very badly. I saw that a toad had a leg coming out from his chin. <coughs> Not only does pesticides affect us, it also affects the sea creatures. Now that I'm in sixth grade, my class is learning about ancient civilization like ancient Egypt, Rome, and Greece. It's very cool to learn things like this. I never really knew anything about Egypt. I just thought Egypt had big pyramids. Now with the Ivy program, I have learned that ancient Egyptians have many different beliefs than ours, which was also something interesting at the beginning, or which was something I was interested in at the beginning. Ancient civilization has helped us, cr helped us to create a calendar and a wheel, which everyone uses now. In every IB unit, we take action on what we, learn, we, what we learned. A way I took action in fifth grade was having a visit from Dr. Tyrone Hayes, the frog scientist <coughs> from UC Berkeley. He had answered our questions about why pesticides were damaging frogs and toads. A couple of classmates and I went to other classes to present to the students about pesticides and the effects on animals. <coughs> In sixth grade, we dressed up as Egyptians for Egypt Day. It was really fun. We had tried foods that the Egyptian had ate. Hey, Aiden, without the IB program, I wouldn't be as successful as I am today. I am an inquirer and a risk taker. I am Ariana Rubio. Wow. I made a few grammatical edits and she changed them back, but she probably did that in about 45 minutes. And we're so grateful for Ariana's leadership. She runs our assemblies. She helps make school-wide decisions. And we really have moved into a student leadership model because of Ariana. And thank you, mom and brother, and all the support from your family. We really appreciate it. Good job, Ariana. Uh, I'm Jennifer Lindsay, I'm the IB coordinator and a sixth grade teacher and I'm just going to kind of give you an overview of the program to the best of my ability in just a couple of minutes. Um, you have a copy of this, this is our timeline. Um, probably the most important thing to point out was that in 2008 is when we started to inquire about participating in the International Baccalaureate and that it was actually two years prior to that that started the journey. And that was when, as a staff, we had a summer institute where we aligned, or I should say, um, integrated our curriculum and really started to backwards map our units of inquiry. Oh, well, at that time, they weren't inquiry, but our units. And the second summer, we focused on rigor and relevance. And it was at that time that we noticed, or we were wanting to vertically align our grade levels in some fashion. And in the process of trying to find something that would allow that to happen, the IB uh, idea came about and we started to visit, we visited a school. We started to talk about it as a staff, took a vote and pretty much unanimously decided to do the IB. And all of that was um, right before we needed to be restructured. So. Fortunately, it kind of worked to our advantage, um, thanks to the district's help and support in that. And then uh, right now, as Sally had said, we are in our authorization years, which has been two years of us as a staff dev developing the curriculum. And um, the most important part for us with the IB, because we had done so much work, was that the International Baccalaureate does not have a prescribed curriculum, so they don't give us textbooks. They really expect us to incorporate all of their components and at the same time be inquirers as we expect our students to be inquirers. So our main, um, well, I, in so it's been two years, well actually almost three years that we've been building and revising and um, redoing what's called our program of inquiry, which is the vertical ali alignment of five units. So this is the overall picture of all of the components in the program. 
In the center is the, is the learner profile, and Ariana had mentioned some of the traits. There are 10 learner profile traits, which are risk taker, knowledgeable, open-minded, reflective, caring, an inquirer, balanced, principled, thinker, and a communicator. This is the one component of International Baccalaureate that is overarching in the middle years program and the diploma program. Um, and then the other difference in especially the primary years program, which is ours, which is called PYP, is that all the students are included in um, the program of inquiry in our units. So on the outside of the learner profile is the written, the assessed, and the taught curriculum, which was developed by the teachers. And I think probably really important to point out is that is all based around the California standards and the adopted curriculum that's adopted by the state and then our district. So, but again, it's a lot for, for the teachers. It's been a big process of refining and sampling and communicating with each other to be sure that we're creating units that could be taught anywhere in the world and still be relevant as a global citizen. Um, then in the kind of blue purplish circle on the outside are other components that are, they're barely described there, but they're the key concepts, which really focuses on questioning. It has a lot of the same types of elements as um, in the gate keg program of depth and complexity. It's very similar in the questioning strategies. There's a transdisciplinary skills, which really focuses on like research skills and uh, communication and motor skills, all sorts of, there's a lot. <laughs> um, and then the attitudes, which is really when the students are learner, when they have the learner profile, um, ad when they have the learner profile traits, the attitudes are shown. So um, that's just another component. And then lastly is action and that some of those actions are big, like Ariana was saying, we have had guest speakers come, kids have collected money for different reasons, or they've been just things that students have done individually, or that parents have expressed that they've seen their own child say, you know, maybe uh, I'm gonna go pick up that dog poop because I know it's gonna go into the ocean because that's what I've learned. Um, and the actions are basically where the students are taking what they've learned and understanding of the central ideas and applying it to their own life. Um, and then, on the, then it shows all the disciplines are incorporated and that is something that is like building in over time. So it's even when I had, we had to submit the application, it was hard to give specific schedules because so much of our curriculum is um, interdisciplinary and that the, the goal would be for all subjects to always be incorporated. And then the very outside are the five themes that vertically align us. So within the themes, they have very uh, kind of, I wouldn't say complicated, but definitions that incorporate many parts of who we are or where we are in place and time. And it's our job as a staff to be sure that between pre-K and sixth grade, all of those components the students have learned about and are aware of and um, have made intrinsic connections and can apply and understand that knowledge as an adult. Um, and that is pretty much my portion. I've just given you a quick overview. And one of our teachers is gonna kind of walk you through one of our units. Karen Delfonso, second grade at Harding School. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm really short. This isn't really for me. <laughs> okay, um, thank you for allowing me to share just a small part of one of our second grade units of inquiry with you. This unit is titled In the Marketplace under the transdisciplinary theme of how we organize ourselves. The central idea is producers and consumers depend on each other for goods and services, and the lines of inquiry are we buy, make, and sell things. Consumers and producers are dependent on one another. And countries trade goods with one another. This is an example of an interactive teaching wall based on the central idea and student questions. It is an interdisciplinary space where all the learning connects. Reading, writing, social studies, science, and math. 
may be explored here. Maps and globes are everywhere in the IB classroom, encouraging students to gain a global perspective. We always start off the unit with a provocation. So if you look here on the left, that's the result of a provocation. Uh, this time the students viewed several pictures of buying, selling, and trading in different settings and countries. Okay. Then students discussed in small groups where their families shopped. We shared ideas and experiences with each other. Each student recorded where their family shops in this web format. You can kind of see where this little girl put her family and then Big Five Sporting Goods, Alberto's Beauty Shop, <laughs> Kmart, um, and everyone was different. To access prior knowledge, the students wrote what we think we know and questions about the buying, selling, and trading of goods and services. The statements and questions from students help drive the instruction. We continually try to connect different areas of the curriculum to deepen the learning. We teach the district adopted math unit on money at this time, in addition to exploring a variety of currency used around the world. If you look on the right, several students brought in money from different countries to share with the class and to look at. Okay. Oh, this is kind of dark, but I'll try to explain it. Um, these two activities promoted international awareness and stimulated inquiry. The students did some research on where different classroom items were made and then graphed their results. So on the right, we had students taking post-it notes and just writing where different items in the class are made and sticking them up on a map. On the left, um, we had students look at uh, stuffed animals. We were having a stuffed animal day for a student council activity. And so they looked at the, st the stuffed animals, found out where they were made, and then we graphed where their stuffed animals were made. The question that arose from this activity was, why does everything come from China? Uh, English language arts standards and skills are embedded in our units of inquiry with ongoing rigorous assessment. We use the uh, district curriculum supported by relevant, other relevant literature, such as the Oxcart Man, A Bargain for Francis, Corduroy. Um, here the students read the story Corduroy and then uh, wanted to know more about what a department store is. So they made their own department store, that's the HUPS department store, uh, created different departments, cut out pictures, categorized them into different departments. Um, and we use this as a jumping off point uh, to do more investigation. Uh, this sort of activity is used to build background knowledge and vocabulary. Here, a few students were researching a question that came up while we read The Elves and the Shoemaker. The research is ongoing, happens every day, all day. Uh, the question was, how are shoes made? So we went on to YouTube, looked for a video that shows how shoes are made. They're viewing and taking notes on this video right now. And then, then the group, um, organized and presented the results of their research to the class, and we posted it. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, I would say this is an example of a guided action. It's not an individual action, but the, many students expressed their interest in trade and barter. We'd read many. We read Little House in the Big Woods at the beginning of the year, and there was a lot of information about how barter was used. Uh, then Ox Cart Man came up again. So um, we decided as a second grade, 75 students, to have a second grade marketplace. Every student in the second grade designed and made something to trade at the marketplace. And you can see what they looked like. <laughs> um, I mean, it was really incredible. Uh, the families uh, are usually involved in our IB action and projects. Everyone must participate. All students participate. Okay, go ahead. And then this is just a picture of my class, each with their projects. 
And then here are two students during the marketplace um, trading with one another. We talked a lot about what the language of business is, what would be the appropriate way to approach someone if you would like to trade with them, um, uh, saying, you know, I like what you made, would you like to trade with me? Yes, I would. No, thank you. There were a few no thank yous. Mm. Uh, and students are continually asked to reflect on their learning. Uh, these are two examples of reflection. You can see uh, they wrote what they thought. The picture on the left shows what the marketplace looked like. The children, 75 children, were sitting in a big circle, and they each had their marketplace project in front of them. And then in groups of about 15, they walked around and traded with each other. Even when, the unit <laughs> even when the unit has concluded, the students are encouraged to note new ideas, knowledge, and action. Um, for example, Esteban is commenting on the topic of purchasing power. He made the connection between currency and one's possession and the quality or quantity of goods and services you can afford. Because if you have a dollar, you can buy something that costs a dollar. <laughs> Uh, Daniel's comment about selling lemonade uh, might lead to investigating the concept of how a business might make a profit. Uh, Vivian's statement about opening a bank account is an example of individual action. She went home and asked her parents if she could open a bank account so she could save money. Other academically challenging components of this program, which require higher level thinking skills in a variety of disciplines, such as written essays, unit content tests, individual projects, and oral presentations, can be seen regularly in our classrooms. We invite you to visit. And in the spirit of the marketplace, our business hours are Monday through Friday, 8 to 2.45. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, that was so inspiring, so engaging, makes me want to go back to school, really. Um, the things you're doing clearly promote inquiry, um, curiosity, um, taking action. It's, it, it must be fun to be a student at your school. I can see that. And I wish you the, and to be a teacher and a parent, exactly. And I wish you the best of luck on May 20, 20th and 21st when you have your, 21st and 22nd, when you have your IB visit. Do you have any feel for what that visit will look like? Sure. Um, the, it's going to be two days. They're going to visit. There will be two people coming, um, or yeah, two IB authorizers. They will tour the school. They will interview all the teachers. They'll interview um, myself, Sally, board members, the district representatives, parents. Uh, students, um, I, I'm trying to think if I'm missing anything else. It, it's really going to be, I mean, because our school's so big, they have to interview everyone from pre-K to six. A lot of it's probably going to be the interviewing, um, and like they are, they are only there for two days. So, and, oh, and then there's all of that curriculum that I was talking about. They're going to review. We have a huge action plan that we've been you know adding to as the years have been going on for the last couple of years so they're going to go through make sure everything is in place um, the application b which was the huge final application uh, they'll basically go they have that now so they're studying it so that they can just come to make sure that we have everything in place at that everything that we're doing okay great thank you. mrs swaski did you want to add to that i just wanted to say because i've been here for this whole journey <laughs> and i know that some of the teachers and staff haven't been here the whole time but many some of them have and some board members um remember back five six years ago seven years ago um i have this is probably 
I don't know, maybe the most, but certainly uh, one of the most exciting things I've ever seen in my whole career of education. And now as I'm <laughs> stepping out soon, I just want to commend the staff and Sally's leadership. I mean, this, this has been a remarkable turnaround. When you go into those classes now and see the difference and talk with the children, the questions they ask, the vocabulary they're using, the things they're even thinking about. It's, it's, I mean, it's dramatic. I've never seen such a turnaround. It's just incredible. Um, so yes, IB is a wonderful program, but really the staff that took it and ran with it is the key behind it all and the parent support. It's just really remarkable. I just had to say something. <laughs> Mrs. Cordero. Well, as one of the board members who has been here the whole time for this process too. Um, I remember when you came forward and you were asking for board approval to even start the, the process. Um, and there were questions about should we allow one school to do it when other schools were not? What about if other schools wanted to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I just remember thinking it was such a great idea. And if you guys could pull it off it would be, um, as we said, as someone said, so inspirational. Um, and I just think you guys have done it. And it's just been amazing, amazing. Um, well, we, we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but you've gotten this far. And this, just even this far is amazing. So, and since um, Mr. Granger is in here, I'll say it for him, at a public school non-charter. Ms. Limon? Well, I am a proud former Harding student, and in full disclosure, I have to tell everybody on the board who doesn't already know that Ms. Alfonso was my second grade teacher when I was an EAL student at Harding. And no, you're <laughs> I'm just even younger. So I, I am so proud of everything that Harding's doing. And I think I heard the presentation, but Sally's taken me through the classrooms. And I would agree, when you walk in a classroom and you see what the students are doing, you hear their questions, you see them doing the group work or the individual work, it makes all of this just so much more real, intriguing, and proud. You're like, wow, this is what an education should be. And so I have to commend all of the staff because I know how hard the staff has worked. I also know that there's been a couple bumps in the road, but everyone has really pulled through and I'm so proud to call myself a former Harding student and I'm so amazed at what the Harding students are doing and I know it's thanks to the Harding community, the parents, the staff, the students who have pulled together. I love walking around the school and seeing where everyone's going, who's getting a master's, who's getting a PhD. Um, it's so neat. So um, I, I, I'm sending all my good energy and support um, as you move forward with this because um, it's quite an endeavor and we're very proud. Um, and I'm very proud that Miss Alfonso was my second grade teacher. She knows she's one of my favorites, she knows. <laughs> And we did not strategically plan the presentation. <laughs> I didn't even know that before a couple of days ago. So, Mrs. Parker. I'll just chime in on the staff piece because I had the opportunity to go down with a number of Harding staff members to Willard School a couple of years ago. And Willard, um, down south of here, is the sort of the model school that was inspirational to Harding in terms of um, deciding to go to International Baccalaureate. And, it's one thing just to walk through classrooms and observe, but it's a different thing to go speak to an IB coordinator at a different school and, and see what's going on at a different school. And um, as she was talking about the amount of work that was involved to bring students up to this very high level, and it's essentially double <laughs> the amount of work that teachers in some of our other classes um, and other schools have to do. And um, so I just say kudos to the staff because it makes such a difference to the kids. So thank you for putting out all that effort. Just a comment. You have an event coming up this week that you want to say about, anything about? Your ribbon cutting for the mural. Oh, yeah, yeah. We do. We are the fortunate, re fortunate recipients of the incredible Children's Art Network program to begin with. And then we have a parent who also has gotten a private donation for our first mural 
part of our strategic plan has always had in the environment goal a mural. So I'm happy to say we have our first mural that is a sixth grade project of student created portraits that are on the side of Mrs. Delfonso's classroom. <laughs> permanently installed and I want to say publicly thank you to the district for supporting the installation. That was extremely helpful. They came on Saturday and we will have an unveiling at 1245 on Friday. Pretty small, there may be rain so we may be emailing but if any of you could come we would really appreciate it. I think it means a lot to the students um, to exit and leave a gift behind. I think that's a nice tradition. And I just want to say um, to the board and district, thank you so much for supporting over the years. The many times I have stood here and said, well, what about this? And I am a firm believer. I feel like this is my torture session to sit here and hear about how wonderful Harding is because in my heart, you know, I've given my heart and soul and I really love our school and I really believe in the IB program for our kids and I really do hope that uh, Mrs. Delf or Karen's request for you to come and visit can be honored in some way because the difference is dramatic and it's often hard to see when you've been at a place over time. But we used to say, how do we teach the kids to ask questions and how do we teach academic vocabulary? And we don't have those questions anymore. It's a natural part of the school day. And so I anticipate IB authorization, all arrows point in that direction and I, from our test preparation plan, which some of you know about, we call Operation Popsicle. <laughs> All arrows are pointing into another increase in test scores, so I really believe that we're in the right direction, and I want to thank you publicly for all of your support. Even when I have stood here many, many times late at night, thank you very much for everything. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Kingston, too, because we know without your leadership this wouldn't have happened, and we know you're, you're moving farther south, but you will be close at hand, and I'm sure you'll be back to visit Harding many, many times. And maybe if Ariana is around in the area in about 20 years, she might be interested in a principal position <laughs> because uh, she sure has what it takes. Okay, It sounded like it, and thank her for coming and, and uh, for staying as late as she did because we really appreciated hearing from her. And I just wanted to add two quick little things. One is that a lot of our kids are already doing performance assessments. So the, co the common core is probably going to be just a it's total, it kind of seems like we're already there. And the second thing is I hope that when our students go to junior high, all of their question asking is not misconstrued <laughs> as being smart, Alex, because they will, especially our older students, question us as to what, how do we know that what we're, you know, trying to explain to them is right. So hopefully they'll be able to just carry on with all that inquiry-ism. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Have a nice evening. Board, we have F3, first reading of board policy 5030, student wellness. There is a minor addition um, to this. Does anyone have any uh, changes or amendments they want to make to this language? Ms. Limon. I don't have changes or amendments, but I would just like to hear um, what some of the feedback has been at the site specifically because I know these are still fundraisers and I sometimes get those magazines that sell well, actually, paper and stuff. The, um, what happened after we, we pulled it the first time it came out, which said no candy sales, and took it back to the ASBs at the high schools and had the kids and the advisors for ASB really kind of wrestle with this and think about language that would be appropriate. And uh, so we didn't do that with elementary, which I know, you know, they're, those fundraising things often do the, the candy sales and the, you know, the, the um, yes, right. Uh, but this language, fundraising activities shall not include candy sales with the exception of school activities outside of the regular school day, such as athletic and performing arts events, kind of captured what our ASBs were saying seemed appropriate. Some of them were actually more strict than this. This still allows what happens regularly to happen, but it, it stops what I know the board for a couple of years now has said, we don't want our kids out there peddling candy on the streets and that, that kind of thing keeping in mind with the wellness policy and then at site. So that's what I've heard and it came directly from the sites as far as what we eventually put in as language. Thank you. 
Mrs. Parker. I think this is great language, and, and it kind of clarifies what we'd already been asking, which is when it comes forward with candy sales, that it not be happening during the school day. I do want to really clarify, though, that we have no authority over the PTAs or PTOs or the booster clubs. So they can be fundraising. In fact, for example, for elementary gift wrap sales, those are generally PTA, PTO sales, and they don't fall under our jurisdiction. Um, and, you know, for, for better or for worse, they just don't. But uh, I think that this is a nice clarification. So. I will add that we have talked to PTAs and PTOs, and for the most part, they're trying to support the wellness policy of the district. So a lot of that has really diminished. I, I wonder if the marketplace might respond to that, too. <laughs> I have to say, I still have wrapping paper <laughs> that I use that I that I bought from my kids many years ago. But, um, You've got cookie dough in the freezer, I hope. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, do we have a motion? Or I guess we don't need a motion, do we? This is our first reading. Unless we want to. Would you like it to come back in April? I think I would like it to come back in April just to give ASBs one more chance to take a look at it. If there's anything else that they want to say, let me just deal with it on the consent would be my request, though. There we go. Okay. Terrific, thank you. Um, we do need to return to D5 on the consent agenda. Mr. Heron, I think that was yours. Uh, just a question. Uh, with money being so scarce, uh, to have 51,000 just go through the system so, <coughs> so easily, uh, I'm just wondering why it all, number one, why it all needs to be done in one full swoop. Why two million documents? Um, you know, why not? Is there a way to take it over a, a three year time period, 49 to 69, 69 to 89? Uh, I don't know what the cost differential is, but um, if, it, I'd like to. if it wasn't a dramatic difference, um, I just don't see why we need to spend 51,000 immediately if we can get by with 15 or 20,000 each for each of the next three years. So I'm just curious if there's a tremendous cost differential to do it all now versus over a three-year period? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying this is the first of several proposals we'll see in digitizing records. We currently have records that date back, I think, in HR 90 to 100 years in paper. Um, we have a warehouse in Oxnard filled with documents. So um, this, this is this is the first of several that you'll see that, and the total cost is going to be significant over time. Um, we can certainly do it even smaller, but my fear is, quite frankly, we as a district haven't attempted to, to uh, address this in any significant way, and I have a big fear of uh, our potential for losing documents. Um, and um, it's going to be, unfortunately, hundreds of thousands of dollars eventually to, to do this over time. And the idea is to bring it forward over time, not to try to do it all at once. So Certainly could be done slower than well, what. I, I guess that's there. my point is, is I can see why maybe 49 you need to do, but why do you need to do 2009 um, immediately? Again, I, that's why do the last 10 years if we've gotten by for 60 years um, without doing it? I, and I don't know what the cost differential is, so I have no idea. But if well, we could spend 10000 instead of 50000 Right. And it just changes in terms of the number of images so that are being digitized. So the, the fewer images, the higher per image cost. Well, yeah. How much that is, I couldn't tell you right now because I didn't get a quote that way. Um, but having heard what Dr. Cash said about the other documents that we need to have digitized, those are all paper images. I mean, they're paper files. They're not the film that we have in student records. So we're just talking about student records right now that date back that far. It's a different scanning process, different digitizing process and software necessary to do that. So the cost may be even different for that process compared to what we're looking at for this. Um, so in a way, we are kind of partitioning this out over time um, with this just being the first approach at, at getting it on digi uh, digital format. We could certainly bring it back with every potential, which I think is appropriate, possibly. Well, that would be my next question. Is it, you say this is the first step. Is the next step at the next meeting? The, the, no, 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 I mean. no, no, no. It would be built out over time um, <clears throat> because we clearly don't have the funds to be able to do it all at once. Um, but that's even more reason to do it in, in increments so you could do 
the oldest things first. Um, I don't know, just a point. Well, unless I, I unless there's a price break for the more you do, well, right? That's the point. What is the price break? I mean, if you, if you could get by with 15,000 for the next three years, or you know, 20,000, is that a better? You know, we, we get criticized for just spending money. And this is just another, let's spend $50,000 even though we're poor. Um, and I know there's good reasons for it. But it does, to the public, look like, hey, we can spend money when we want to, uh, but boy, let's you know, cut all the teachers. And so, Well, I do have um, the um, Allied Imaging representative coming on the 5th to start looking at paper, the paper um, process, the, the, the files for the other departments that need to be digitized as well, but inviting other companies as well. This uh, decision here was uh, reached with only two of five uh, requests for proposals from uh, other companies, and this one happened to be someone that was used by the district before and a cheaper proposal. Ms. Limon. Um, <clears throat> this is a lot of money, but I know at least um, in other institutions of education we're being asked to move towards digital records. Um, so I know at the university this has been a big thing. We've gone through accounting. We're all digitizing um, our own records with a federal program. It's constantly being asked of us, especially during audit, because of the accessibility and security um, with digital files versus hard files and who can access them and how they can get lost and backing up information, et cetera. So I think that um, it's as we move forward, I'm going, we're probably going to expect to see more requests uh, to, digi to digitize, digital digitize. digitize all its, what time is it again? <laughs> uh, all of our records. That's my fault. Um, and so I, uh, it is a lot of money, but it actually, I think this is part of um, a systemic approach for a lot of institutions, education, educational institutions um, all around. So. I mean, if you would feel, I mean, if the board would feel more comfortable, we could certainly give you the, which, what, which is what Mr. Sumter was alluding to, the long view of here are all the records that we're going to have to turn into electronic records. Here's what the anticipated cost would be. Um, that would be helpful. Mrs. Parker. I think my question is, this is the microfilm. This is 1,045 rolls of microfilm. It dates back to 1949. We don't microfilm student records anymore. No, I don't. When, did it, when did it end? We, uh, before I got here, um, <laughs> but at least for the last couple of years, maybe three, um, we have summer staff that come in to That's do the scanning, scanning of that previous year's records. Right. Okay. So for the last few years, anyway, at least, we have been digitizing our own records. Okay. So this is not, I mean, these are all things that are older, and it's just a question of, I mean, my, my concern is there's no guarantee that something that was created in 2000 and is on microfilm is actually in perfect condition. And if we, you know, it could be that there's, you know, some environmental something has happened to something that was done in 1995 that makes it actually in worse shape than something that was done in 1965. Um, and so I, that's my concern is that the sooner the better in terms of getting these records digitized so that we don't risk permanently losing things for students that may need, you know, may come back to the district and need uh, evidence of courses and I, I, taken and so forth. And I understand Mr. Heron's concern and, and what, what he's saying. Um, I might add that my office staff, when they go to scan these films to try to find student records, many times they they break just on threading into the machine to look through the scanner, uh, not to mention the multitudes of, of films that have broken from trying to roll them through the scanner as they're going through. They jam and, and you know, they end up having to tape them together just to get the, the records that the students have requested or ex-students have requested. And I suspect there's a lot of staff time that goes into that that would yeah, not, and, and not have to, to be many used. many times this year that machine has been repaired. Right. Well, Board, would you like this to come back as the longer view and broken out into smaller pieces? Could I get a sense from, from you all what you would prefer? I'm okay with just voting on it. Yeah, my, my preference would be to vote on this piece and then at some point, maybe even in a board brief, get the longer view. Yeah, um, that's coming your way. But I kind of feel like this is the broken down part. Um, this is taking it in chunks. Correct. So this is, this is the records first. Right. Okay. All right. 
Okay, so I will move to approve um, D5. D5. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we are done. Um, any coming uh, agenda items anyone would like to mention? I have one item. Okay, Dr. Cash. I, I had asked if we could set our date for our, our annual workshop in July. I was wondering if um, board members were able to identify blackout dates that were not good or dates that were good, or would you no. like to get back to us? None of them are open? No, no, wide open. Oh. It's going to be in July. Do you want to just propose a few dates? And I know Mimi already sent out an, she an did. email to this effect, and you're, I guess you haven't heard back. That's completely. correct. So, would you I like? Don't remember, I don't remember getting okay. there. Would you like me to have that? I could send that out again tomorrow with some proposed dates yes. and have you yes. vote, and we'll. Yes. Okay. Super. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. Okay. Then I am um, going to close vote. this meeting. Dr. Christensen, don't leave. <laughs>